Can you hear me? Oh, long, yeah, I can hear myself. <laughs> I'll just wait for one last, two last people. Right, hello everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk today. I hope you've had a great DDD East Midlands so far. Um, quick introduction from myself, as you probably already guessed, my name's Steve Collins. I go by the alias of Steve Talks Code, because Steve Collins is such a common name. I'm a .NET developer based in West Sussex, and I also co-host the Milton Keynes .NET user group with Leighton Laporta. If you want to find out more from me, I use that alias for my blog and Twitter handle. So today we're going to talk about source code generation. But what do I exactly mean by source code generation? Well, for me, it falls into three categories. First, you've got code rendering, which is basically just what a web server will do. You, you're sending out HTML and JavaScript to go down to the browser, gets executed there. In the context of what I'm talking about today, that doesn't really count. I want to focus on the last two. Dynamically creating code at runtime that executes in memory. So you've got things like JSON serializers, you ORMs like Entity Framework. The new hotness that came out last year with .NET 5 is C-sharp source generators. And I'm going to have trouble with my teeth with that, saying that through there. So I'll just call them .NET source generators. That's creating code that gets generated at design time and gets included in your compiler. So it gets treated as if you'd written it yourself. But the first half of the talk is a retrospective of how did we get to this point. I've been playing around with source generators for about 30 odd years. They say that you can tell usually someone how old there is by the first Doctor Who that they were aware of. I'm gonna venture that you might be able to guess when you started developing by which source generator you started with. So for me, if you indulge me, I'm just gonna go on a little history tour of the 1980s and 1990s. So for me, source generation started in 1988 on one of these. So if you're a similar age to me, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. If you're not, you might have seen these in the news lately with the sad news of the passing of Sir Clive Sinclair, the inventor of it. But this was my childhood computer and where I learned to program. But back in the 80s, of course, we didn't have the internet. So whereas you've now got things like GitHub and Stack Overflow to go and look at other people's code, we had to rely on paper magazines, nipping down to the news agents every month. These invariably had listings printed in BASIC. Now, of course, back then, there wasn't the omnipresent different languages. BASIC had lots of different dialects. So you had to buy magazines for your particular computer to actually be able to type it in. So here we've got a listing for the Spectrum and the basic user's guide, which came with it, the back in the days when computers came with a programming language. So as you can see, long basic listing, 32 characters wide because that's the width of the Spectrum screen, and that's what came out of the printer. Problem with basic, on the Spectrum at least, was that unlike these days where we have compiled languages, we have, it, it was an interpreted language. So each line was done as you went through, Second thing is the Spectrum only had an 8 megahertz processor and 48k of RAM. So these things could be quite slow, especially if you, it was quite common to get an out of memory error. If you wanted to do anything more snazzy, you had to resort to machine code and learn the assembly language. So I went up to the National Computer Museum at Bletchley Park, um, what, about a couple of months ago, and saw all the old 80s computers, and I went up in my loft and went, I'm going to dig out my Spectrum and all the books I learned from. So these were the assembly language books that I, I learned from and dug them out and took a nice little photo of them. This last one on the corner, I'll come back to. So we've got a little snippet of assembly language on the left. Now the problem is, is that section there is probably 20, maybe 30 bytes long, if that. You're not, if you sent that end to a magazine, they're not gonna spend pages and pages of their valuable print space printing out an assembly language listing. So instead, you resorted to doing hex listing dumps. So with this, you've got a line number, data statement, eight bytes of hex, and a checksum to make sure that you've typed it in correctly. What's this got to do with source code generation? So this is where 1988 kicks in. This edition of your Sinclair 
had um, this data banker program written by Tom Baker, but not that Tom Baker. Um, I was fascinated by this, the, this idea of code generating code. Because you type that in, you'd run it, and it would start appending data lines towards the end of the program. You could then save them out and then run that, sort of, that machine code. What was interesting for me was this statement that the feature editor put in there. Here it is, quite short for what it does, and I'm quite surprised that Tom used basic instead of machine code. Been learning machine code. Challenge accepted. In my youthful naivety, I didn't realize what a challenge this would be. Unlike some sort of modern day computers and programming languages where it's all Unicode or ASCII text, the Spectra had heard this weird and wonderful way of creating keywords by doing various key presses. So to get to that data statement, you had to hold down the caps shift and the symbol shift and then press D, you'd eventually get to the data command. So if we fire up our 1980s telly, oh, the programs, parents have left the on BBC One again, change over, boot up our Spectrum and start typing. So you'll notice that the cursor keeps changing it for different letters. Those are the different modes that the keywords or syntax would work with. So I mentioned that book, The Spectrum ROM Disassembly. The Spectrum had a basic language of about 90 or so keywords. They're represented in that table. Because it was done on a keyboard presses rather than just straight passing text, what you had to do was actually work out how to get those keywords in as if it had been typed in. That's where the ROM disassembly book kicked in. The modern day equivalent, I guess, would be looking at the Roslyn compiler GitHub repo to see how that, the compiler works. So here it is in all its glory. Four months of evenings not going out and weekends being a very sad 19 year old. So whiz it passed. And it's dog food, and it's, I actually used it to generate the listing that I sent off to the magazine. So, 1989, flick through, all excitement of my news agents, and on page 80, data banker, two. Now, there was a couple of things I noticed. The feature editor, it was his last issue, and I think he got a little bit carried away. Unfortunately, it's a bit blurry on this screen. But apparently, it was the most revolutionary and visually astounding routine in computer programming history. <laughs> I take that. I mean, my ego can handle that. And then it occurred to me, it's his last issue. He's probably just having a laugh at my expense. Second thing was, spelt my name wrong, I'm Stephen with a PH. Third thing, they promised £50. I never got that £50. So on that basis, I claim this to be open source programming. It's free. Moving on, a few years later, we get to about 1993, 94, something like that. And I was working in a pensions department of an insurance company. I wasn't a programmer because all they offered me was mainframes. And I went, I've been using the Spectrum. I'm not using a mainframe. My mate Dave, who'd been off to university and come back and got a job as a programmer, said, you might like this Visual Basic thing that's come out. OK, I've got a PC, I'll try it. So you would not believe the grief of trying to get this to work on Windows 10, but I eventually got it done. 16-bit does not like 64-bit operating systems. Visual Basic 3. This was the next step in code generation, but it's not true code generation. When I include it, I was the, uh, impressed by this thing where you could just drag and drop stuff, click on it, and it would create an event handler for you. I thought, that's cool. A lot better than assembly language. So between that sort of 93, 94 and about 2000, 2001, I went through all the different versions of Visual Basic, starting with Windows Forms applications for enterprise, right the way through to VB6, where I was writing e-commerce applications, <coughs> excuse me, a classic ASP, the dreaded Visual Interdev, and VB6 COM components. Now that was a challenge and a half. Now, the VB6 COM components usually needed to talk to a database, so you'd have a database access layer, which meant writing DAO, or later ADO, code to talk to things like stored procedures, because we still had DBAs who refused to let you access a table directly. So, 
The company I worked for had a few bright sparks in there, but obviously that was proprietary, I can't get hold of that. But you can find on the internet similar programs of the time. So here's an example from Database Journal where someone writes a VB program that can read the SQL metadata, so back then it was still sys objects, sys tables, sys columns, sys procs, etc., and then go and generate a stored procedure. It will do your CRUD stored procedures for you and also generate the VB code you can bring into your VB application. So this was the, kind of the next generation of source code. It's all about metadata and reading SQL tables. But things change. VB became Parse and Microsoft jumped on the internet bandwagon and called Microsoft.net, because it's, you know, the internet. And things move further forward. So because they were all into the internet, the big thing was web services, interconnected systems. So with the web services in, v in .NET original version, they were a ASMX files, not WCF at this point. But because it was an industry standard, you had WSDL as the metadata to be able to exchange information. So from there, they had the service util command line where you could point at a WSDL file and it would generate a VB or C sharp file for you. But of course, coming from VB background, I was used to a GUI. Command line, I know we all love command lines now, but back then everyone wanted a GUI. So you had a wizard inside VB where you could point at the URL, get your WSDL down, and it would generate some source code for you. With the immortal line, this was generated by a tool. <laughs> no need to pass comment on my code. <laughs> so we've now got these static, these classes that the service util will generate. Slight problem was the generator was very much locked in. So if you wanted to change the code that it generated, you, you were stuck, you could, couldn't do it. It did have various event handlers that you could wire up and intercept certain calls. So it's kind of like the strategy pattern, but it's more of an observer pattern. Nowadays, in Visual Studio 2019, as well as SOAP services, we've got OpenAPI for REST services and gRPC with its proto files, but I'll come on to that in a bit. The other interesting thing is I think it was about 2005 or 2008, we got the generated code attribute. That is useful because if you've got things like Roslyn analyzers or Read Sharper, it can look at that code and go, you know what, I'm not going to analyze that because the tool's generated it. It's, I'm not going to comment on something that the tool's generated. But it's interesting that those early code generators had an influence on the C-sharp language. So in C-sharp 2, we got partial classes which meant that you, instead of the designer file and you plug in your code in at the bottom, when a designer file changed, stuff could get lost, so it got split out. So the code generated stuff would be separate from your code. And it always still had the thing in the designer file that said, don't touch this, because if you do, it's gonna get regenerated. People still did that though. So come C-sharp three, we've now got partial methods. So instead of having event handling, lines of code, you've got partial methods, and you could do your own implementations in your partial file. There were some limitations, because this was before Roslyn, this was the old c -sharp compiler. So with this, there were the limitations of you couldn't put an accessibility modifier on it, so even though it was private, you couldn't call it private. You couldn't have an output, it had to be void, you couldn't have any output parameters. The idea behind that was so that the compiler could inline it, and if you hadn't provided an implementation, it wouldn't write the code. We've got C-sharp 9 now and source generators that I'll come on to, but those restrictions have now been removed because we've got the Roslyn compiler, and that's smart enough to go, you've got this partial method, but you haven't given me an implementation, so I'm not gonna compile it, I'm gonna blow up and say, you need to have an implementation. Going back to the original .NET, we didn't have it in VB originally, but when we got to .NET, we got reflection. Now, I'm sure most people are familiar with reflection for going and inspecting code, but there is a code generation element to it. You've got reflection emit. Now, this isn't generating C-sharp code. As you can see there, you've got the emit generator and you're using opcodes, that's MSIL. That's the low-level intermediate language before it gets compiled down to machine code. But if you look at those opcodes, 
It's not a million miles away from the assembly language I was writing on the Z80. The other thing about reflection is it doesn't cover the whole of the .NET framework. But the really nasty bit about it is the security issues. Now, everyone's familiar with SQL injection attacks. If you had some dynamic code that was emitting code that would execute at runtime, you're potentially opening a hole for code attacks inside your process. Not nice. And in fact, there's lots of restrictions around reflection emit in .NET Core and .NET 5. So regular expressions, this is the joke. I've got a problem, I use regular expressions. Now I've got two problems. But regular expressions build on top, that, top of that reflection emit. So what it, a reg, regex class will do is it'll take that pattern and the matching logic, it'll create some metadata to then go and convert that to MSIL. So you've got an interpreted mode and a compiled mode. If you keep newing up different instances, it's going to go and generate those over and over again if you're using dynamic um, patterns. If you've got a static pattern, it will go and cache it. So you've got an option there that says cache the MSIL using the compiled option. You could take it further, and actually there's an option where you can generate an assembly file, take that over to another project and reference that assembly file. But, as you saw, writing opcodes is not a quick way to write a program. So we move on to Visual Studio 2005, and we get the custom tool code, code generator. The place you're probably most familiar with this is the designer for web config and app configs in framework, and also the ResX resource designer. Those designers will go and create, have an association with a custom tool generator. So for your web config and app config, you get a settings.settings .settings file that's a static class that's an object model over parts of your um, configuration. It doesn't cover the whole of an app config or web config. It's mainly the app settings section. For resources, you get a static resource manager where you can, you can say properties.resources.whatever you've named your resource. Problem with these is they don't adhere to things like solid principles. They're static classes with static methods. And they, those static methods are using static methods on things like the configuration manager and the resource manager to go and pull stuff out of your config file or resx file. So they're not that extendable. You could go and write one yourself. Now, this is the first time with Visual Studio you can go and write your own code generator. Reflection emit, that's kind of code generation, but yeah, it's runtime. This is about design time code generation. But because Visual Studio still had a lot of roots with VB and Visual C++ and Interdev and all those not old sort of early 90s versions of Visual Studio, there's a lot of com interop going on. So you had to jump through all these hoops of having a GUID on there and registering it with Regism and all this stuff. Not exactly friendly. So they didn't really take off. Sorry, quick sip water. I said about the external template generator that I use with VB6. I'm hooking that up to a database and getting my store procedures for CRUD, DAO, ADO. In .NET, things started to get a bit better. You started to see tools like this. Now, this is one I used from about 2007 through to about 2010, 2011, something like that, my generation. And you could point it at virtually any database if it had a driver. And it would go and create your CRUD store procedures and your VB code, and you could do interfaces, which we didn't really have in the old VB. I liked this because it was doing the same kind of thing again. But when .NET came along, we started to things like nHibernate, link to SQL, entity framework. These kind of things fell out of fashion, and I think the last time this was updated was in 2014. Outside of Microsoft, there's a movement about aspect-orientated programming. So this is also sometimes called cross-cutting concerns. So you've got things like logging and performance and caching, transaction management. This takes a different approach. This takes your compile, it takes over the comp compilation process and steps in when it recognizes certain things and creates some MSIL and it weaves it into your code. 
It can even rewrite parts of your code if it so desires. Now, the two most famous of, in the products in this area are Posha, which is a commercial product. So you, you're into various different license models for that. And then there's Fody, which is an open source product. But more recently, even though it's MIT, they're now asking for financial contributions. So from Tanya's talk this morning, why, why not? People are putting a lot of effort into this open source pr product. When we get to C Sharp 3, Link got introduced. Now, Link in itself isn't a code generator. All it's doing is it's putting delegates over your functions when you're using C Sharp and objects. But what Link do does add is these providers, and they sit on top of these things called expression trees. Expression trees are a way of modeling code, a bit like we saw with the reflection emit or the, um, the other one I had on there, where you can express it as a node of a tree with different lambda expressions. With the lambda expressions getting converted to, to sorry, the lambda expressions becoming expressions in the tree, nodes in the tree, you can effectively inspect that code as well as execute it. At the bottom line of it, it still generates MSIL to execute. Oh, sorry. But what, one thing I, that is interesting about the providers is that the link providers allow you to write not just .NET code, but with Entity Framework. That's the glue that then gives you your SQL statements that EF generates. So talking of Entity Framework, Entity Framework is the pick and mix store of all the things I've talked about so far. So we've got inspection of SQL metadata, which is what things like my generation were doing. You've got code inspection of .NET classes, so reflection. You've got expression trees to turn link queries into SQL queries. And then you've got reflection to go on to bind the results of your SQL queries back onto objects. T4 text templates came in a later version of Visual Studio. Now, these are very much a Visual Studio technology. You can have a template, and the, the common one that's known is ASP.NET MVC uh, scaffolding for controllers and views. These are based on the code tool generation, where you've got this text templating file generator. So TT files are associated with that. So when you re recompile a template or one of your source files changes, you have to manually trigger it, but that will go and generate your C-sharp code. There's also support for runtime templates, but that's limited to .NET Framework. The problem with these templates if you go and write your own, is they're very much a Visual Studio technology. They're nothing to do with the compiler or Roslyn. There is very limited support outside VS for them. The code you write inside a template, because Visual Studio doesn't really embrace .NET Core inside itself, you're limited to .NET Framework for the coding in there, which limits the C-sharp version you can use. .NET Core and .NET 5 I had to look up on it, and people were asking about, could we use them? And the, the answer that came back from Microsoft was, we've got to rewrite the whole engine to be able to support those. And it's not on our roadmap to do that. That said, since VS 16.6, you can now use a, co a T4 template in a core project to go and generate core code. You just can't put core code inside the template engine. So we said about SOAP services earlier, and I alluded to this wizard. Excuse me. So we had SOAP services, but now they're just called WCF web services. You've also got OpenAPI, which is the standard for defining the metadata about REST services, and gRPC, which is the other new shiny, which is based on proto files. So the open API spec one, when you run it, you run it and you point to a, a JSON swagger file, what it does is it adds one of these, where I can find it, open API reference elements to your csproj file. That is, that is a build command to basically say, call the nswag engine. Now, nswag is Rico Suter's thing for doing um, both client proxies and server generation. But in .NET Core, it's only there for Core for client proxies. If you want to generate a server or you want to use it in framework, 
you can go to the NSWAG repo and there's an IDE for it. Like source generators, once you've got that open API element in your CSproj, it hooks into the compiler process. So with the open API reference and the NSWAG, when it came out, it wasn't very well documented. So what I did was I took all the commands from NSWAG and I documented them on a blog post. With gRPC, you're not limited to the client proxy. You can actually go and create a client, a client server, client, sorry, client, server, client and server, or just the objects that, are part, that get exchanged between the two. I haven't used it that much, but there's a link to the Microsoft Docs website for it. So that's where we've got to up until 2020. I just want to generate some code. And so far, there's been lots of things standing in my way. Either I'm tied to Visual Studio, I have to go outside Visual Studio. I'm tied to .NET Framework, or I'm tied to .NET Core. It could be closed source, so I can't control what it's spitting out. So there's lots of problems there. And then we had a new hope in 2020. C Sharp 9 and the .NET generators. Technically, they're called C Sharp source generators, but it's really a Roslyn technology that's come about during the Roslyn release of C Sharp 9. It doesn't generate IL. This allows you to generate genuine C Sharp or VB source code. You don't need Visual Studio. It's a Roslyn technology. So you can, if you've got it bound in, you can go to .NET, bit, .NET build and off it will go. One thing to be aware of though, we talked about IL weaving, being able to modify your own code. These don't, they only generate new code. You can extend your code if you've written a class as a partial class, and then you can target a partial class so it will bring the two together. So we're back to the influence of the C-sharp language again. They're relatively easy to write. If you're doing something very simple, that, that's great. But, as you'll see, the, it can get very complex. You can get your input either as code syntax by watching code within the, the target project, or you can point to additional files. So the stuff I've been doing is I've been pointing at JSON files and generating objects based on the information in JSON files. You don't have to use template files. In fact, I would probably say you probably don't want to, because whilst you could put a template engine in there, Bear in mind, this is the compiler process that gets fired over and over and over again, as Visual Studio wants you, to, Roslyn, to check the code so it can do its squiggly lines to say you've got something wrong. So if you've got a template file being generated over and over again, unless it's super fast, you're going to slow your compiler down. What I really like about C Sharp, see, I knew I'd have trouble with this in my teeth, C Sharp source generators, is that you don't have to bundle up and compile them and go through all these hoops to get work with Visual Studio. You can have a solution which has got your generator and your target project both in the same solution. You just do a project reference to it. You do have to do a few extra things though. The main thing is when you write a source generator, you have to in implement the iSource generator interface and decorate it with a generator attribute. To get to that interface and the attribute, you need to have a few NuGet packages. So we've got the analyzers, because really this is sitting top of, on top of and Roslyn analyzer technology. You also have to have the .NET standard library. Because of the way it works with the Roslyn compiler and also Visual Studio kicking it off, you have to have, do a .NET standard 2.0. You could do 2.1, but it does limit you in some ways. You can't do, do .NET Framework, you can't do .NET Core, you can't do .NET 5. The Is Roslyn component was added in Visual Studio to support debugging with Visual Studio 1610, I think it is. So that's quite a re relative addition to it. You've then got your, so you've got your package references down here. Now I have got a reference to system code DOM that I didn't include up there. System code DOM is another way, a bit like expression trees, of expressing code. But a lot of people say you know, it's complex and it's nasty. So 
I said there were two methods, the initialize method and the execute method. So the initialize is your hook into the compiler engine. That's the thing that says, I'm registering my source generator to go and listen to syntax changes. For that, you have a syntax receiver that gets these changes. You could say, Has, I'm looking for a particular thing. I'm looking for an attribute or I'm looking for a comment or something like that. And when I get one of those, I'll go and kick off the execute. If you're just using things like JSON files or CSV files to generate your code, you don't really need to get involved in the initialize method. But it is useful later on when we get onto debugging. So the execute method, this is the meat. This is where you can read code and you can generate code. The standard way of doing a source generator is to build up a string and emit it at the end, which gets added to the compilation process. Now, there's several ways you can do that. You can use string literals, but that gets really messy with having to escape all your quote marks and your backslashes. It does get messy. There, is, there was talk for C-sharp 10 of having a new syntax, a bit like you had in VB, where you could have literals directly in the code. I think that's been pushed back to C-sharp 11 now, but that would, make, that would take away the need to constantly escape all your code all the time. You, could, you can read from data inside things like JSON files, CSV files. You could even write your own domain-specific language and write a parser. But if you want to hook into code that's already been written and react to it, you need to start understanding the, the syntax that comes out of it. The main thing is, the last action is adding that source string back into the compiler. So I've taken the, the, the graphic off of the Microsoft Docs page and just, just animated a bit just to highlight the process that's going on there. But this is where I loop back to the stuff I learned when I was writing that code generator on the spectrum. It's all about the syntax, same as it ever was. Back on the spectrum, I had to learn how to interpret those basic keywords and order them in the right, uh, right way, get my punctuations right, get the line feeds right, and so on. Same when you're writing C-sharp source generators. So when you get your execute method, you get a syntax tree and a semantic tree. So the syntax tree, we'll start at the left, you've got the simple stuff, all your white space, your formatting, your comments, your preprocessor directives saying, if I'm using debug mode, include this debug.print, et cetera. We've got syntax tokens. These are the lowest level. This comes back to the keywords. So like I had on the spectrum with the basic keywords, you've got your C-sharp keywords or your VB keywords, your variables, so your literals, your punctuation. But before you get down to that low level, those get grouped up to syntax nodes. So these are your namespace declarations, your class declarations, your method declarations. Rather than looking at that, it's probably easier just to look at good old hello world. So I'm going to focus just on that namespace line. So we've got a namespace declaration node, a namespace token that lives inside that declaration node. We've got some white space. We've got an identifier node that's subordinate to the namespace node. And then we've got the token that I've given it, the name of demo syntax analyzer. We've got an end of line. But how do you know how this syntax tree works? Well, luckily, there's various tools that show you the tree. So if you copy and paste into something like SharpLab.io, you get your tree view there, and you can start to do, do that. And if you've ever written C Sharp analyzers, then that, will, that tree is very, really valuable, because when you're analyzing code, you're looking at the raw syntax. If you've got full-blown Visual Studio, you can add in a few bits and bobs to it. And then you even get nice directed graphs on there that show you how it's all come about. So that's syntax. Syntax analysis is all about the structure of the code. What does it look like? That's the thing that triggers your code generation. But to do something useful with it, you need the semantic tree. Now, if you're familiar with reflection, then that's where you can go and say, I want to look at this class. Tell me the methods. Tell me the properties. Tell me the parameters to methods. What functions has it got? What constants has it got? Semantic analysis is effectively the same thing, 
but you're working at compile time rather than runtime. And this is where this becomes really powerful because a lot of the things that you currently do in reflection, you can move back to the compiler and get them to work, work, be worked out at compile time. So you're not taking that hit at runtime in your application. So say you've got something like you're looking at the members of an enum to convert them to strings. Well, you could write a source generator to do that and you're not taking that hit at runtime. Additional files, I've alluded to this, so I'll, I'll skip over this, but basically you could have JSON files, CSV files, text files, your own DSL, whatever you want, you, you can pass it. But bear in mind, things like JSON and CSVs, if you're using NoGet packages, they also need to be compatible with .NET standards. You can't rely on .NET framework packages and you can't rely on .NET core packages. What's also nice though, is that because the additional files are added to your csproj file, the compiler's aware of them and it can watch them for changes. So why should we use them? Hopefully I've, I've sold you all on the c -sharp generators because they are much, much better than what we've had before. So the key things are that it's part of the compiler chain, you're not tied to Visual Studio. So you can use them with code, Rider, Notepad, MS, not, yeah, MS Build, .NET Build. They generate code as if you'd written it. It is true c -sharp code, none of this IL nonsense and weaving it. It's done at compile time rather than runtime, like you would with reflection emit, so you're not taking a runtime hit. But last but not least, is you can view and debug the generated code. Now, trying to do that with the IL, you'd have to get a disassembler, you just don't want to go there. But like all these things, it's not a perfect world. There's going to be a gotcha, isn't there? The generator, as I say, is stuck with .NET Standard 2, so that does kind of limit some of the functionality, but not hugely. The one thing that people might jump on is go, I could write something a bit like the NSWAG thing that goes off to a REST service, grabs its swagger, pulls it down, generates it. I could do the store procedure thing again. But you wouldn't want to do that as an inline thing as part of your generation process, because remember, as you're typing away in Visual Studio, Visual Studio is saying, Roslyn, does this make sense? Does this make sense? Hundreds of times as you're typing. You don't want any I.O. going on there because it, A, it's going to slow it down, and if the I.O. breaks, your whole thing's broken. So if you do need those things, do something like they've done with the Open API reference, where you go off and grab a JSON file or a structure, create some metadata, pull it down, and then use that cached metadata file. You don't have the dynamic the response to changes, but at least you're not suffering the I.O. hit on it. The downer on these is that they can only generate c -sharp and VB files. You can't generate JSON or ResX files at the moment. There are plans that possibly in Roslyn 4 that might come along, along with incremental source code generation builds as well. But your source generator is not working, it's broken. What have I done? So, the debugging experience when source generators come out in Visual Studio 2019 with Visual Studio 2019, it wasn't great. It was awful. Things have got better since 1610. The, I mentioned the is Roslyn component um, element in the C -sharp project. That triggers so you can do a debug profile that says, when I build this on a debug it, go and use this target project and run through and debug using this target project. That's okay, but there's a slight problem. Firstly, in VS 2022, it's broken, but I, was, I checked earlier this week and it is fixed for the next preview or the live version of 2022. So that's all good news. The reason for that is that in 2022, you've now got a de new default prof debug profiles dialog box and something's gone wrong. They haven't stitched it all up together. The main problem with debugging in Visual Studio is that when you first get hold of your source code generator, it aggressively caches it. So you've done your first build of it or used, used a, your first run using it. Visual Studio keeps hold of it. If you're debugging it, you stop the debugger, you go and change some code, it keeps that cache one, so you've got to go and recompile it, restart Visual Studio, start the debugging all over again, and your developer loop gets quite long. 
the approach I took before we had the VS 2019 um, tooling was to create an alternative build profile. So you've got debug and release. I created a debug source generator. So I could do if debug source generator, debugger launch, debugger attach. And then you, you could have Visual Studio Synthesize do a .NET build on the command line, and then that would launch Visual Studio. You could start debugging. You stop Visual Studio, you make a change, you recompile it, go back to .NET build, and you're in business. You're not having to wait for Visual Studio to keep restarting. The obvious thing to do is write some unit tests. Now, in an ideal world, you do TDD on this. But I find with things like plumbing and what have you, you're, you're iterating over and over again. So you've got to kind of really know what you're doing with, the t doing with it to do proper TDD. So I find it's quite an iterative process. But it's not as simple as just saying, go and point at this project and go and compile it. What you need to do is generate some source code, stick it inside a string, so we're back to the problem of escaping string literals all the time. You get it, that string passed into a syntax tree. You pass the syntax tree to the compiler. The compiler will then invoke the source generator. You look at the source generator, get your output, and say, does this match what I'm expecting it to do? So that way, this whole debug nightmare that you've got iterating around and restarting Visual Studio, that goes away because you can get your build, it, your build server to do this overnight. So if anyone changes it, you can say something's happened to my source generator. So there's a couple of really good resources about the source generators. The first one, I don't know who Amos92 is, but they've compiled a list of all the ones they can find on GitHub and various blog posts and the list is huge. Now they say they make no guarantee about the quality of these things, but if you're just starting out, because they can be a little bit tricky, especially if you're doing stuff with syntax, then that's a good place to start. Microsoft have got the Rosling cookbook for them, and that's more of a general guide about how to write source code generators. But we've got .NET 6 next month. What's new in .NET 6? So Microsoft have started dog fooding this stuff and making use of it themselves. The first place is on the riser compiler. So here they've improved the build time by using source generators. So if you're doing a build, looking at the Blazor ones, you've got a massive speed increase because it's using source generators to work out how to do the compilation of the Razor code rather than doing, using reflection. The second one is logging. So if you've been using .NET Core or .NET 5, you've got the iLogger and you have to check that the logger is enabled. Then you go and say it's information or error. You have to have an interpolated string and then put your various variables inside the interpolated string. The source code generator doesn't take a lot of that weight, but it reshapes how you do it. So at the top, you've got your typical thing where you've got an instance logger, but now you write a partial void and you pass in the parameters that would go into your interpolated string. You decorate it with the logger, mos logger, message? logger message attribute, but you're still doing, so in terms of typing, you're not actually saving a huge amount, but it is doing these things like doing the is enable checks for you. Below that is the co source code that gets generated. The biggie with source generators in .NET 6 is system J text JSON serialization. Now, up until now, a bit like Newtonsoft, it always relied on reflection to do all its work. This changes in .NET 6. They're now using source generators. So if you bring over your core 3 or .NET 5 code, by default, it will still work the same way. It uses the existing reflection model. But if you, use, you create one of these JSON serializer contexts as a partial class and decorate it with JSON serializable, you can specify a way that you want it to work using source generators. Now, there's two optimization models that you can use individually or together, depending on the circumstances. The first is the optimized serialization, so taking your data models, spitting it all out into the JSON. So all the logic of going through all the properties, doing conversions, that all gets done during compile time rather than runtime. Flipping it on deserialization, instead of using reflection to go and do all the binding, you can have pre-generated data models that can handle the bindings for you. 
So that's .NET 6. Quick look into the future. If you've got school-age kids, this might be familiar to you, the BBC Microbit. So going back to the days of the Spectrum, there was the big battle, the Spectrum, the Commodore 64, the BBC Micro, Dragon 32, Auric. BBC was the, the big thing about getting it into schools. This is sort of like the grandchild of the BBC Micro, effectively, where BBC have sponsored this. So you've got an interface where you've got these jigsaw pieces, a bit like Scratch, where it can all be done together. But what's interesting, as opposed to Scratch, is you can then generate JavaScript and Python for it. So we're starting to see GUI tools. And if you think about things like the Microsoft um, Power Platform, it's kind of doing the same kind of thing, but in business. So it's glu just gluing stuff together and effectively generating code for you. There's been a lot of buzz about GitHub Copilot using AI against GitHub repos. So as you're typing, it starts to guess what you're gonna type next. Now in Visual Studio, we've got IntelliCode as well. And I did, did ask um, someone at Microsoft, was there a plan that the two might converge? And the answer was probably not. This is based on OpenAI's engine. Now the next bit I found really intriguing. On OpenAI's open website, you've got this video which can take natural language and generate JavaScript from natural language. So I will leave that playing just for a minute or so while I take a sip of water. So as you can see, it's taking this natural language and doing step-by-step, -step, generating some JavaScript. Unfortunately, I recorded this at 4K, so it's a bit, bit jumbled up on the screen. But like these things like Scratch and BBC Micro, not so much BBC Micro, but things like Scratch, where you can generate games just by dragging and dropping, this is potentially the next step of that kind of thing. And then the ultimate one. NVIDIA's experiment on the 40th anniversary of Pac-Man. This was done just by watching 50,000 games of Pac-Man. Now, they say there's no game engine involved in this. This is just by watching it. That is mind-blowing to me. This could be where source generation could go in the future, for all we know. Will we, will we all get the sack? Will we still be developers? I think we probably will be. But it's interesting to see the, the convergence of developers, source code generation and AI all potentially coming together. So I think Copilot and IntelliCode are just the first steps on a new journey into source code generation. So in summary, and to loop back, right the, back to where we started, when I was doing the code generation on the spectrum, it was about two things reading data and then understanding the syntax to send out back to the basic program to hold those data statements. The same is true now. Here we are 30 something years later. Metadata is the, your raw input. So it could be API structures. So we saw things like WSDL and open APIs using the Swagger libraries, things like that. We saw database structures, so we saw the things like my generation, entity framework, and hibernate, things like that. Code syntax, C sharp source generators can read code and understand it and let you make decisions based on it. At the bottom of it, it's anything that you can read and analyze, even if it is just memory on an 8 bit spectrum. Flipping it on its head, What's the point of a source generator? It's to generate some code for us. To do that, we have to have code that's actually gonna run. There's no point generating something that's gonna fall over as soon as you try and compile it. So it's understanding the ta target language, and you've got various tools. You can either write your own source code in a string literal, but that's putting a little reliance on you. You could use things like the code DOM, you could use expression trees. There's all sorts of ways you could do it. Some of them come with performance hits, which you don't want to hit on your compiler. The downside is that because you're writing this inside the model of something else, you're inside a 
quotes, you're using the code model, you haven't got intelligence to help you. But that's things where things like the syntax trees analyzers can help you. So you can start to look at those and work out, this is what I need to look for when I'm analyzing stuff, and this is what I need it to look like when I'm spitting it out again. So if you haven't got IntelliSense, that's where unit tests come in, because real-time debugging is awful. And with that, I've just about got my breath left. Thank you for coming to this afternoon. If you want to keep in touch with me, I'm, as I say, I'm Steve Talks Code. I'm on Twitter and I have a blog. I don't update the blog that often, but I've mainly focused on dependency injection and configuration in the past. Milton Keynes.net user group, I run with Leila Porter. We're on the first or second Tuesday of every month. If you want to hear more from me, and I haven't scared you off by rattling through this at 100 miles an hour, um, I'd, I've previously done two talks that you can find on YouTube. There's the Configuration is Easy talk, which is from about two, maybe three years ago. And more recently, there's the Dependency Injection Booster Jab talk that I did at things like NDC London last year. Also appeared on podcasts. So you've seen Jamie Taylor out and about. I've been on the .NET Core show. And two, three weeks ago, I was on Dan Clark's Unhandled Exception podcast talking about dependency injection. I've just about got enough breath to say thank you very much. Um, and I hope, hope this has been of interest. <laughs> Anyone got any questions? Stunned silence. OK, in which case, thank you very much. And feel free to go and get some coffee. Thank you.